I'm um, glad to be on tonight to uh, talk a little bit about our cover crop research project we started a couple years ago. Um, and I'd just like to shout out to all those who have been participating on this project. It's been uh, quite a project uh, and a big learning curve and we've learned a lot. We kind of want to share what, what we've learned over the last couple of years. Before I get too far, I just kind of want to go over a basic uh, description of, of cover crops. Uh, you hear that word a lot and sometimes we're not quite sure what we're talking about. Uh, basically, it's any crop grown to provide living ground cover. So we're trying to cover the ground and it's planted with or in between rotations of the primary cash crop. Um, there have been a lot of research and, and discussions about the benefits of cover crops. And I think that's what has perked a lot of interest in Utah uh, because of the weed suppression, uh, preventing nutrient leaching, soil erosion, sequestering carbon. So there's a lot of interest in the soil benefits of providing a cover crop. And these benefits have been uh, talked about at a lot of soil health workshops we've had over the last few years across the state, which has generated quite a bit of interest in cover crops. But as we start talking to farmers about their cover crops and there's a lot of questions out there. Um, you know, when to plant, what to plant, how to plant, how to terminate, what the cost is gonna be, what the benefits are short term. Um, and, and the big one is how to incorporate cover crops in our current crop rotations. And so when we're taking a little stab at that, there's a little bit of information on our USU Extension website, uh, some cover crop fact sheets that you can pull down and get a little information. But we decided we wanted to get some hard data here in Utah. There's a lot of research going on in other parts of the country, but there hasn't been a lot on irrigated land uh, here in, in uh, Utah. So this project, we uh, selected three sites uh, for research. Uh, one here is in San Pete County, Central Utah. We have one site in Davis County and one site in Cache County. Uh, we are looking at both warm season and cool season cover crop mixes. And each of these mixes, there are five different mixes that we're looking at. Uh, we put them in replicated plots and we are planting about 40 pounds per acre on our seeding rate. And we're looking at mainly conventional tillage, but I have dabbled a little bit in low till and no till, um, trying to see how we can make that work. Our warm season mixes, um, these are, so we've got five of them. The first one is a control. And our control we put in as a Sudan grass. Uh, uh, we felt that was a good grass that people can get a hold of seed pretty easily and a lot of people have grown this before. So that's our control, just looking at just putting in a warm season grass at 100%. Our mix number one, we're gonna add a hairy vetch, a legume to that. Mix number two, then we add a broadleaf to that, uh, buckwheat. Mix number three, we add a radish to that. And then our fourth mix is we call the kitchen sink or everything. We have three different warm season grasses, three different legumes, three root crops, and two broadleaf plants. So we've got a, a good diversity there. This is uh, some pictures of our plots as we are harvesting them for uh, forage uh, yield and quality. You can see they have grown quite well on our plots. This one's in Lewiston and this one's here in San Pete, or actually that one's in uh, Kaysville. Just to look at our plots, our warm season, so we harvested them at 80 days, about 80 days, and we're looking at dry matter per, tons of dry matter per acre. 
And as you can see here in Lewiston is the blue. We are over five ton to the acre uh, on the first three. And then mix number three, we're adding more. So we're losing a little bit of the production. Um, and by mix four, we're down to four tons. Uh, in Kaysville, we're looking at about three tons in the control, jumping up to four tons and then slowly going back to under uh, three tons, just slightly under. And in San Pete County, we were a little, almost three and a half, a little over three and a half ton, down to three ton in the mix number one, and number two, number three, and uh, about two and a half ton in mix number four. Um, let's look at quality, so protein percent. Um, I've added one more bar here. We decided to take a 45 day reading on uh, the Lewiston plot. As you can see, it makes a big difference uh, when you harvest this or when you graze it. Um, in the Lewiston plot, we had uh, just under 10, just about 9% crude protein. And on the 45 day in that control, we're well over 15, 16, 17 um, uh, percentage of protein there. So you can see quite a difference depending on when you harvest or graze that. But overall, pretty good quality feed. We've got close to 10% there in Lewiston and jumping, look at this four mix, we're jumping up to 15% crude protein. So uh, yeah, pretty good quality feed for some good growing animals. Uh, it's interesting, that was probably our uh, best soil and probably most fertile area. Um, San Pete, or let's look at Kaysville now. That's the gray line. It's pretty low quality forage. We're just over five to six percent crude protein, jumping a little in uh, four, three, and four, a little higher, but still quite quite a low quality forage. Whereas in San Pete, it was kind of in between, I would say, on fertility and uh, we're close to 10, especially a little over 10 in that mix number four. Um, then total digestible nutrients. Um, as we look at that um, in Lewiston, uh, we're about 55%. Um, as you can see that 45 day in Lewiston, 65 all the way up to almost 70%. That's amazing, good feed there. Um, but most of us bounce in between uh, 51 to 60. Um, let's look at our cool season mixes. We decided in our cool season mixes to do a three-way mix, a fall three-way with wheat, triticale, and barley. That's our control. And then in mix number one, we added a legume, a winter pea. Mix number two, we're adding uh, a radish. Mix number three, we're adding a radish and a turnip. And mix number four, we're, we've got the, the basics there, but we're adding another brassica, a kale, and some more legumes. Our, our vica pea, I think that's how you say it, and, and vetch. So um, pretty diverse mix there. Uh, we just planted them this fall. So right now we've got them uh, uh, this is plant. This was planted in Lewiston on August 17th uh, this fall, and this picture is taking taken on August 31st. You can see we've got good growth on this. It's really starting to come along good in a couple weeks, and then we took another picture on September 30th. You can see we've got good ground cover and uh, a good growth going into winter. Uh, this is just a shot of our plots in San Pete County. We planted them on August 28th, and this picture was taken on August, October 8th. So a little over a month of growth here, and this is inches, and we're not quite 12 inches, but we're, we're probably at 10 inches of growth uh, going into the fall on this, on these plots in San Pete County. Uh, just a couple things I just throw out that we kind of learned through our hard knocks and trying to understand how to incorporate cover crops. 
a uh, big thing was planting dates, uh, planting warm seasons well after average last frost date. I, I jumped a gun and planted a little early and tended to um, have a struggle uh, getting some tonnage out of that. And then we found planting cool seasons uh, uh, quite a bit before your last fall frost. That proved to be very important. I, I planted it way into October and we did not get much tonnage out of that. But now you can see we, we went earlier and uh, we're getting a good, good amount of forage there. Our 80, a uh, couple other thoughts, our 80 day warm season plots, you know, we're looking at dry matter tons per acre at three to five ton. Uh, our crude protein was from six to 15 ton, 15%. So um, uh, depending on your fertility and the TDN from 51 to 60. Uh, this is a no-till drill that our um, conservation district has in San Pete County. And we utilize that the first year to do a no-till uh, portion of our plots. And what we found is we had really dry soil at the time and this uh, has some depth bands on it that didn't allow it to go in the soil too deep. And we had a lot of problems with that and we did not get a good stand. And it looked like the birds enjoyed all the seed on the, on the top. So since then, we, we turned around and decided to go with just an old international drill, but we did kind of a low till. We took a spring tooth harrow just through the ground uh, uh, twice and then ran the seed, drilled seed in after that. And that seemed to work a lot better uh, with this heavy soil that we're dealing with. Just a couple acknowledgements. Uh, this was uh, funded through USU Extension Grant Program and uh, Dr. Yost and Dr. Creech and uh, me and Cody and, um, and Jacob. Jacob's not on here, I didn't put him. Jacob from CASH. Um, and, and a lot of summer interns. We appreciate all the work on this and we plan on collecting data for another year. And we hope to be publishing some of this information to help people out. And we also hope to uh, be doing uh, on the ground field days this year. So we hope to see you at those if we can clear the COVID issues and get people out on the ground. Great, thank you, Matt. Up next, we have a 10 minute panel discussion with several of our, um, of our extension faculty. We have Matt Palmer, Jacob Hatfield, Matt Yost, and, um, and Earl Creech uh, for the panel discussion. So anything and all things cover crops, um, please go ahead and enter your questions in the chat box and we will get them answered for you. Okay, Matt, there is a question in the chat box from Stephen Price. How late into the year do you typically have irrigation um, at the cool season sites? Yeah, well, in San Pete, I'll speak for that. Uh, Cody and Jacob can talk about their area, but luckily we have a well, so we could um, irrigate up until like the uh, October 15th. Um, it got too cold, so we kind of shut it down earlier, but we basically got one uh, pass, 12-hour uh, set on that before um, we had to turn the system off in San Pete. Is okay. Jacob or Cody there? Yeah, yeah I'm here, Matt. Um, up at Lewiston, we actually went, we went till about September 20th in that area. Um, just because we were lucky because it actually got pushed back the irrigation schedule this year. So we were going actually later than usual. So. Okay, next questions from uh, Jody Gale. What crop did you uh, follow? Let's see, follow in the rotation with the cover crops. And I guess I can answer that. Um, basically, we're following with another cover crop, so we're re replanting that cover crop and running it one more year is what we're doing. What we're trying to mimic is an alfalfa 
where you're coming out of alfalfa, you could go into a fall uh, cool season crop. And then you could follow that with a warm season cover crop and then go back into alfalfa or whatever cash crop you're wanting to go into. So we thought with those two, with a cool season and a warm season, it could fit into most of our crop rotations, whether it be corn or uh, alfalfa. Thank you. Okay, another question. Um, Chris Dunham wants to ask if, um, if you have listened or heard about John Kempf, um, Advanced Eco Agriculture. Um, he finds his information is amazing. I'm not familiar with him. I, I've watched Gabe Brown. He's got quite a bit of information on it, but uh, I haven't followed that one. Anyone else on the panel? No. Okay. Sorry. Well, Reagan, there was a question up above that couple asking about planting depths. Um, what, how deep do you plant your cover crops? And I, if I can address that just quickly. Um, so each species that, that you're planting as a cover crop is going to have an optimal seeding depth. And usually it ranges from anywhere from half an inch down to two inches. And, and so you'll want, you'll want to just look at kind of the optimal seeding depth for each species. Now where it gets really interesting is when you start to put two or three or four or five, six species together <laughs> um, and, and trying to pick the optimal seeding depth is a challenge. You, you can't, you can't vary your seeding depth, right? For, for all those different types of seed unless you ran a drill across it six times, which, which you don't want to do. So, uh, so that's kind of a challenge. I think the best thing that we recommend in that case is just to look at the optimal depth for each of the species and then try to pick, try to pick an average and, and maybe err on the side of going just a, a tad bit deep than, than going a tad bit shallow. Um, and you know you'll want to watch your condition, your planting conditions to guide that. But yeah, that's that's kind of what we would do for planting depths. Thanks, Matt. Okay, I, next I question. would just oh, go ahead. Oh, I right. just add add to that um, in our um, no-till uh, option when we tried that. That was our main issue. We couldn't get deep enough, and a lot of that seed sat on the top. So yeah, I would agree with that try to find a little deeper if you can especially when you're going in cool season that's what we were doing it was hard to get it in the ground thank you okay next question would you recommend fall grazing or fall incorporation with a 10 inch growth at the first part of october well if you're asking me i'm an animal science guy so i'm going to say grazing <laughs> If you can get electric fence, that's what we did in the Sampy County area. We put electric fence across that and uh, put the cows in and they were grazing uh, about two days and moved that across uh, the pasture. They, they grazed that down really well um, and took care of it, put a lot of organic matter on the soil surface. Um, so it, it turned out really well, but I think uh, there's a good way of incorporating it too. Any others have a suggestion? No, I, I'd give similar advice. If you can utilize it, get some animals out there, great. If it's not an option, yeah, then, then probably incorporate it. The, the nice part about the animal side is they're going to eat it and, and compost it inside them and put it back out. So it's going to turn over a lot faster. Nutrients are going to turn over a lot faster than uh, just tilling it in. Okay, and um, this is kind of a related question. So have you done soil tests to see if the cover crops improve soil organic matter? So we took our soil samples uh, at the beginning and then we're gonna wait this two years and we're gonna take another set this year to do comparisons. Yes, we plan to do that. 
Okay, and then I believe this question was already answered. Uh, Matt, did the no-till drill work for planting the cover crops? Were you able to get good germination without tillage? What were your results? Yeah, so our soil is really heavy, kind of a heavy clay soil, and it was dry. So we did not get enough with that no-till drill. We did not get enough depth, um, seeding depth with that. And I came back a few days after and saw a whole flock of pigeons just really enjoying our plots. So I think we did not get the incorporation. And that first year, it was dismal. It was a lot of weeds. We, we couldn't even collect the data that year. So that's why I did the spring tooth harrow. I, I think it's got to have a little bit of tillage just to get that into the heavy soil. If you've got a lighter soil, I think it may work okay. But with our heavy soil, we struggled with that. Okay, um, let's see. We can have time for one more question answered and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, Let's see, are there any custom grazing outfits that are working with planters to match cows with cover crops? I, I don't know of any, and maybe you others can speak up, but I know that is something of interest. Moving livestock back onto the cropland, really, they're showing a huge benefit in soil um, health. And so if you're next, so, so there, the idea is if you're next to a livestock operator and you don't have livestock to um, custom graze or have them come and graze your crop off, because a lot of the problem they're saying, well, I don't have an, I'm not getting any money out of this cover crop and I'm spending all this money to, to get it. But that's one way to recoup some of that money and increase soil fertility and soil health. So yeah, incorporating animals into um, a cover crop option is really a good idea. And if I can just add on to that, Matt, real quick, just they actually, there's been some people in Washington state, they haven't had any data published yet, but they're actually working on incorporating cover crops into pasture settings. They're not a custom grazing unit or anything, but they're trying to kind of adapt that and mix it in. Um, I mean, these pastures are under pivots, so it's pretty ideal conditions overall, um, but they're trying to see what kind of differences that can make as an impact. So it's a little bit of a different system, but they are looking into that in some places, so. Thank you. Um, so we've run out of time for, um, for answering questions on our video. Um, so please panelists, uh, answer the questions in the chat box. There are several more coming in. Um, up next, we have our last presenter for the night, and.